Good morning, everybody, or good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you are in the world. A very warm welcome to you. My name is Ali Board, and I am very proud this morning to be broadcasting on the SAA's Facebook page on behalf of Hannah Mule, those fantastic paper producers. Now, I've been really looking forward to this event. I can't tell you. It's very exciting to be here with all of you. So you may have noticed from the start graphic that uh, this has gone under the banner of something called Technique Tuesday. Now, just in case you are new to Technique Tuesday, that is something that I have been doing for well over a year and a half now. I've been broadcasting live right here here from my studio down in Dorset on the south coast of England and I've been trying to uh, keep in touch with everybody via the fabulousness that is social media by uh, sharing thoughts, by sharing processes, by sharing demonstrations, all sorts of things with you and today it's a brand new one just for you lucky people out there. Now Technic Tuesday, because this is currently going out live on Facebook, you might be watching this on Catch Up, you might be uh, watching this via another platform. Um, we're going out live so what I tend to do during Technique Tuesday as you have taken the trouble to tune in I like to give you a little bit of a shout out. So I'm going to go back through the comments just to say a few hellos. Now if I miss you uh, popping up and saying hello I do apologise. Unfortunately I've got to concentrate on a painting, but I promise you that I will go through the chat afterwards and I will make sure uh, to either like your comment or answer any questions you may have. So should we see who is in the room? Rosie saying good morning from a very hot France. Rosie, you get my award of the day for being the first comment to. Uh, Janice, good morning, my lovely. Who else have we got in the room? Maureen, Anne, Rabina. Lynn, Joe, Thyra, Kathy, Jane, Linda, Joe. Gosh, you're all in this morning. Uh, Anne is asking, um, she's saying, good morning, have just made a coffee, very jealous. Have you recovered now, Ali? Anne is referring to the fact that I've just finished two weeks of exhibiting as part of Dorset Art Weeks. And I'm on a bit of a roll, Anne, if I'm honest, hence the broadcast this morning, so I'm all uh, psyched. Sue, good morning. Julie, Julie is saying good morning from a very wintry, Melbourne. <gasps> yes, not like that here. Very sunny here, but it's usually the other way around, isn't it? Good morning. Thank you very much. And the lovely Hannah Mule is in the room too. Uh, Nula is there as well. If you have any questions about the paper, I know that she is very happy to answer anything. And if she can't answer anything, like I said, I promise you that I will go back through the chat afterwards and answer anything that I possibly can. Gosh, everything is coming in thick and fast. Uh, Jan, Leslie, Lynn, uh, Martina, uh, other, we've got lots of Lynns this morning. Um, Ali WT, Anne, Wynne, Brent, Liz, my mum, my mum is in the room. Thank you, mum, for tuning in. Lizzie is in Suffolk, uh, Doris, Kat, Joe, Monica is in Scotland. Fantastic. Uh, Susan, gosh, we are scattered across the globe, aren't we? Joe, um, yes, and I'm still on an adrenaline rush. Uh, Val, <laughs> Pippa, Trisha, Tara from the SAA, she's in the room too. Uh, Jane, lots of people saying good morning. It's so lovely to have you here. I genuinely mean that. And uh, what's even more lovely, um, as a demonstrating artist, you occasionally get these fabulous invitations to be able to show the thing that you do with products that you love. And so obviously, if you are an SAA member, then you will know me. You will know that I pop up all the time with uh, things to do with the SAA, but I absolutely jumped at the chance when Hannah Mule asked me to introduce the agave watercolour paper. Now, I know from chatting to some of you that some of you have already had a go with this and are interested to see what else can be done with it, but you might have tuned in this morning thinking of making a, a purchase, thinking of making an investment in that paper. Um, or you might have got your little sample and you're thinking, oh, I don't know what to do with it. Anyway, let me introduce you to that agave paper. Let me give you a little bit of background 
on Hannemuel and uh, we'll see if we can get you as excited about this paper as I am. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take you to my overhead camera. I'll give you a little bit of information on the agave paper. But like I said, Hannemuel are in the live chat. So if you have any questions at all, Nula is there to answer them for you. So let's go to, let's try this camera. <laughs> so here is the agave paper. Now this is the agave paper in a block. I'll talk more about that in a second. But I wanted to introduce you to the paper itself. Now the agave, the fiber itself comes from a sisal plant, which is very, very fast growing. And it means that it is resource saving as a raw material. So if you are environmentally conscious, you might want to consider this. You know me and the products, you know that I like to do a little bit of research into my products to where they come from, the things that you can do with them. Now here is that agave paper in sheet form, okay. Now to give you a bit of information on uh, Hannah Mule themselves, let's drop this down. Here is the Hannah Mule logo. I put it on the uh, start graphic so you know what to look out for. Now Hannah Mule, as you can maybe just see in there, is an old company. They were founded in 1584. In fact, I was reading about them in the last couple of days and they're even on the same site that they were when they were founded all those years ago. They started off with writing paper, have gone into artist papers, but they now uh, have digital papers as well. And when we talk about the agave paper as an environmentally conscious paper, there is something else I wanted to draw your attention to. I'm just going to flip this over over to the back of the pad and just up here um, a little bit small let's see if we can get it in the close-up camera and, and then you can, can see exactly what I'm talking about there I'll, I'll talk, talk more about the paper itself, itself but can you see, see that, that lovely little logo, logo there? there the, the green, green rooster, rooster they're, they're calling it and this is an environmental initiative by Hannah Mule. And what that means is they invest their money in environmental uh, projects. In fact, they give 5% of their profits back from any of the green papers that they sell. Isn't that a fantastic thing? What a lovely thing to be involved with. So let's tell you more about this paper in particular. I, I just love the cover of this. Isn't that beautiful? Just absolutely beautiful. So here's the plant itself. Um, and it is a watercolour paper, although I am going to push it to its limits today. I'm going to be uh, putting lots of mixed media things down on it. Um, but I promise you it's going to be very exciting. Um, so this is a block, so it's glued on four sides. Look, little sheep in there. Um, it's glued on four sides. It also comes in sheet form. This is uh, a sheet that I cut into quarters if um, uh, I... Um, if you wanted to have something a little bit freer, then uh, possibly, oh, sorry, my camera's just decided to do, let's switch to that camera. I don't know why my camera's gone all a bit peculiar this morning. It's just deciding to uh, be stroppy. Of course it is. Joe is saying that there's trouble with your sound when you uh, go on close up cam. Okay, Joe, thank you very much for that. I will uh, try to keep that in mind. The joys of live broadcasting, obviously. <laughs> Um, anywho, what was I saying? This is in sheet format, so I cut this sheet up. You can decide whether you want to purchase it in sheet format or whether you want to purchase it in uh, a pad as well. Can someone just give me a quick shout out if you can hear me properly now? Um, just as I've gone back to the overhead camera. Uh, could you just give me that shout out in the chat? That would be good, just so that I know that you can hear me. Okay, if not, I'll make some tweaks to the sound. So let's go back to the paper. This is the star of the show. Um, this is a 30 by 40 centimetre. It comes in a range of sizes and the links to where you can purchase this as far as the SAA is concerned are all up in the details on this broadcast. So it might be, thank you, Nula, um, 
Um, fabulous. Thank you every <laughs> very much. It's always a trouble to know. I'm talking to myself. Never know whether you can hear me or not. Brilliant. Lovely. Um, so up in the details of this broadcast, um, you should be able to see the details of where you can purchase this paper and a few links to other things as well. So uh, go back when the broadcast is over and follow those links. Of course, you can go directly to the SAA's website. You can also go over to my blog as well, where there are all the details to do with today's broadcast. Now let's have a look at the technicalities of this paper. So down here it says that it is 290 grams, grams per square meter, 135 pounds. So around about a standard issue. Now don't forget, just in case you don't know, the weight of the paper isn't always a thing that uh, it's a guide for the thickness but it isn't necessarily the thing that tells you how thick it is. It's much more important to discover its colour holding properties and its water holding properties. And that's why we're going to have an experiment with it today. In this block, we've got 12 sheets. And down here, just at the bottom, if I lift this up ever so slightly, it says, there we go. So it is 70% agave fibre. So that's that sisal fibre that I was talking uh, about right at the top of the broadcast. But it's also got 30% cotton rag. So it is 100% a natural fibre paper, which, as you know, is a fine and dandy for the things that I like to do. Now, I thought before I do that demonstration, I'd show you some of the experiments that I have already done on this paper, which if you're an SAA member, you may have seen. But if you're joining us uh, new, then you might not have seen some of these paintings. So here's a little primrose sketch that I did at the beginning of the year. You can see it takes the watercolour rather beautifully. And there's gouache on here and there's Posca pen, all sorts of things going on on the surface. And then a couple of months ago, I wrote a piece for SAA's Paint magazine. In fact, there is the exact article that I wrote. So there's the SAA's Paint magazine, and I wrote all about this particular hummingbird painting. So here is that uh, agave plant. I wanted to include it in the painting and some very experimental watercolour techniques blowing it across the surface. Good morning to anybody uh, who is just joining us. Yes, you are very, very welcome. So there's a few things that I have already done on this paper. And of course, today we are going to bring you that fantastic shabby sheep portrait. Now I've turned my paper this way. Don't read anything into this. I've turned my paper this way on because sheep is going to be landscape way on. And here is the photograph. Now you've got it just up here. In the corner so if you are painting along at home or you want to rewind this recording and uh, watch it on catch up the photograph is there but if you follow all the links in the post you will be taken either to my blog page or to the discussion that happened before this event went live where the resources are there for you if you go back over onto my blog the resources are there for you to download as well so that you can print them out now in terms of copyright i know some of you are very mindful about copyright uh, this is a photograph that I took, so you are very welcome to use it. All I'm going to ask, if you do create a painting um, on uh, the agave paper, all I'm going to ask is that when you share it on social media or you exhibit it, display it, or whatever it is you're going to do with it, would you just be kind enough to either attribute myself or to attribute Hannah Mule and the SAA. So after a workshop by, that would be really great and uh, would help us out enormously to get people um, understanding how this paper works. So I took this photograph, this is quite an old photograph now. I love it, I come back to it lots and lots of times because um, she just makes me laugh. So this is a you, you can see she is incredibly pregnant. Now just over here in the top left hand corner is a little mate peeping out uh, from behind as well. I'm actually not going to be painting her because it actually looks like it's sort of, she's sort of growing out from the sheep. So I'm missing her out. 
And if you'd like to see the painting that I'm basing this morning's demonstration on, here it is. Here is the original shabby sheep painting. Now this is a painting that took a little bit longer than some of the things that we're going to cover today. So my painting isn't necessarily going to look exactly the same as this one. Why would you want two paintings the same anyway? Because this had uh, quite a few print making um, techniques in the background. So some of those lines, some of those textures and things uh, going on in the background, we're not necessarily going to cover today. And let's just show you, um, there she is in all her glory, that lovely pregnant you standing face on, facing me down because I had a camera pointing in her face and uh, she was just protecting herself really. And who can blame her? So you've got that photograph to work on. I'm going to just prop that up over here so that I can see her. She's in my line of sight. And also in the resources, um, I did you a line drawing as well, just in case you are not very confident with your drawing skills, particularly if you're doing an animal portrait. So I've done a line drawing already for you. That line drawing was based on this sketch that I did. So here she is drawn out on that paper. Isn't she fabulous? Let's hope uh, I can do her justice when we paint her. So uh, here she is, like I said, she's landscape way on. So you could put her portrait way on. And I wanted to take you through how I have got this to this point in the proceedings, okay? Uh, so I lay my line drawing down and I tacked it down with a little bit of framers tape. Now I want to give you a bit of a handy hint, okay? The agave fibre paper, because it is such a soft surface and such a natural surface, it doesn't like masking tape an awful lot. So don't be surprised if when you stick your masking tape down, you sometimes lift off the surface. However, there's a really easy trick around how you can get past that. So if you have stuck your masking tape down and you're thinking, oh, crikey, I've left that a little bit too long. So let's stick mine down, for example. Let's stick it down, give it a good old burnish. If you want to make absolutely sure that you can lift it off the paper, your heat gun or your hairdryer will lift it off perfectly. So we can heat it up a little bit and peel it off. There we go. Not a mark on the paper at all. I know there's been some discussion about that on social media, but that is just the fastest way of doing it. It works a treat. So I stuck my line drawing down and then I used this product, which I'm sure you're all aware of, but if just in case you're not, this is traced down. This is a transfer paper. Looks like this when you purchase it. Looks like this when you take it out of the packet. It has graphite on one side and it's slightly paler on the top. And all you do is you slip it underneath your line drawing, making sure that it is dark side down. So you slip it underneath. And then you take a biro um, or something similar and you can go back over your line drawing and when you peel it away, that's when you will find that it has transferred onto here. So if you're not very confident painter, that is a nice easy way of taking a small shortcut to the bit where we throw colour at it. Because let's face it, that's why we're all here, isn't it? Now, one of the things I wanted to do with this lovely shabby sheep was to create some texture on it. And I thought we would do, we'd talk about some resist methods. Now, the resist method that I've got in store for you today is using gesso. Now, gesso is a primer for oil painting and acrylic painting. You usually uh, plaster it over a surface so that you can paint with your oils and your watercolours over the top. But it does some rather interesting things when you use it underneath watercolour and other water-based media because it partly repels the colour and it partly accepts the colour. So what I have done, I have done a little bit of a blue Peter moment. If you're not in the UK or of a certain age, you won't, you won't understand what I've done. Um, but what I've done is I've actually put my texture down already. Now, I understand that there were some sound issues in the overhead camera. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to very quickly show you the texture in the close up camera. And uh, I won't talk too much, but just so that you can see that texture that, that I, I have put, put down. down. 
So what I'm hoping is I've made a few camera tweaks and actually um, I've just seen what it is that's possibly the issue with that overhead camera. So I'm hoping you can see. Now, can you see this lovely sort of rippling effect underneath? Let's tip it in the camera so that you can see it nice and clearly. That is the gesso and I'm going to show you right now the uh, how I got that gesso down onto the surface. So, oh no, we need uh, we need the photo one up. There we go. So what I did was I've got a scrap of card. This is just a packing card here. And I, you can see this is where I prepped it last night. Yes, you could. There's some comments coming in asking if you could use watercolor ground. Yes, you could use watercolor ground. Um, the only difference between watercolor ground and gesso is that watercolor ground isn't necessarily going to repel the color. OK, um, and that's not a bad thing. That's just a different thing. That's just a different avenue to explore. But yes, you could use gesso. You could use white acrylic, which is going to repel the color entirely. Have a play on a piece of paper before you launch yourself into a full painting just to see what happens. Lovely. Uh, sounds like the sound is better now. Good stuff. Glad I uh, clicked a button. Always good. Now, the way that I'm loading this onto uh, my sheep's body, because I want to create, uh, you can see it up here, that kind of lovely rippling pattern in the fleece. So I'm going to take my palette knife. I'm going to tap just the edge of it into the gesso and very lightly tap it around about on the surface. You don't need an awful lot. Don't go mad with it. And the other thing that I'm going to do is use the back of my palette knife to create that kind of royal icing snow kind of texture. Now, it's entirely up to you. Good morning, everybody who's just joined us. Um, it's entirely up to you where you put this texture. OK, um, bearing in mind that if you are using something that is going to repel the colour, you need to think about where your highlights are. OK, so let's go back. Now we've sorted out the sound on uh, overhead camera again. Let's go back so that I can show you that in more detail. You can actually see now where I've popped that little bit of gesso on where it's still wet. So I've created that kind of lovely patterning and you can see. Let's lift it up a little bit more. Look at that. So hopefully that color is going to hit and miss. It's going to uh, play about with the color as I lay it down. So I've put some around here, some around her chest area. And I've also put a little bit up here just around her face too. I haven't put any on her face. I'm going to rely on other things for that. But um, hopefully that gives you a bit of an insight. Now, I'm going to give this a quick, quick dry because I have put some extra uh, gesso on there. So just bear with me whilst I give this a bit of a waft. Now, because this is stuck down, this pad is stuck down uh, on four sides. It means that the paper is not going to particularly go anywhere, which is good news. But of course, like I said, you could use it in sheet format if you wanted to. So the choice is entirely up to you. I've been using both. Both work very well with all the experiments that I've done in the past few weeks. Uh, I can see that Mick is in the room, our resident Technique Tuesday poet. Um, good morning, everyone who has just joined us. It's very lovely to have you here live in the room. Don't forget that if you are watching this on catch up, no matter where you are watching from, I do hope that you're enjoying the tutorial. Don't forget, of course, if you do watch this back on catch up, you can put me on pause, which is no bad thing, is it? So <laughs> I've got the gesso down. Oh, Pam's just done joke of the session. Joining you a little bit late. <laughs> Everyone's groaning at home, Pam. Thank you very much for your input. <laughs> So this is all dry. Now, I need to wait for it to uh, cool off a little bit. You don't really want to be putting colour back on a warm paper. Um, you want to be... Morning, Joe. Thank you for tuning in. You uh, want to be uh, putting it onto cold paper. Otherwise, your watercolour is going to dry a little bit too quickly. Now, I'm going to do something that you might think, why on earth is she doing this? OK, I'm going to start working back into this uh, sheep with a permanent, with a waterproof sketching pen. 
Why am I doing that? I'm doing that not because I plan on doing a pen and wash. I'm doing it because what I plan on doing is throwing all sorts of color at this and I don't want to lose my pencil drawing. Now, I don't want it to look too harsh. I could do it in a black pen and that would be fine. I could do it in a brown pen, but my there's not an awful lot of uh, brown on my sheep. So I think if I didn't have the gray, black would be preferable. But the reason that I've got a gray pen is so that it looks similar to the pencil. And let me get that little scrap of um, agave paper in so that I can do a scribble in pencil and I can do a scribble in graphite colored pen. And you can see there's not much difference between the two. The great thing being that because this is waterproof, this is going to stay put. The chances are if I painted over the graphite, that might disappear. So I'm providing myself with a map. And if you've watched any of my Technique Tuesdays before, you will know that I like to give myself a map of where it is that I'm gonna go. I'm gonna give myself some scope but uh, that is what I'm going to do. Now I'm going to go, oh, glasses on. I'm going to go back over her face. I certainly don't want to lose that after all the time and effort that it's taken to uh, sketch her out. I don't want to lose those contours. So we'll come around here, that incredible mouth that she's got. And while I make my way uh, around this, let's tell you a little bit about this pen and I'll see if there's any questions in the room. So this pen is made by Unipin. This is a 0 0.5, you see I had to check because I couldn't remember. A 0 0.5, it's water and fade proof and it is in dark grey. Those are the details of the pen. And because of the surface of the agave paper, it's gliding over the surface really beautifully. It means I can do my little bit of Morse code drawing so that I get some lovely mark making and some lovely clean crisp lines which is very nice indeed now I want to while I'm doing this I want to address the question that Pippa has just put in the room Pippa says if you use a pad do you have to limit the amount of water or doesn't the damp go through to the sheet underneath this might be a daft question Pippa never ever a daft question there are no daft questions because for all the questions that get asked somebody else in the room will be thinking oh thank goodness that someone asked that I was wondering about that when you're using a block because of the quality of this paper because it is a natural fiber and because it is a 290 gsm it isn't going to affect what's underneath unless you really really are horrible to your paper and you literally wet a hole and punch a hole all the way through it okay um one of the other things to mention about this paper which you might not have realized is that it's acid free. You might have seen that from our little tour around the pad at the top of the demonstration. It's non-aging, which means it's not going to yellow if you put it on display. But the other thing that makes it so fantastic, and I know a lot of you out there will understand why I've gravitated towards it, is that it is vegan. It uses no animal products in its makeup at all. So if, like me, you are a bit mindful about the products that you use, because not all art materials, this isn't a discussion that we're going to get into, but not all art materials are um, vegan, then uh, this is certainly a paper that you can rely on. So I'm getting those last little bits of detail in. Let's uh, give you that, let's move it over to this side and give you that in close up so that you can see the pen marks. There you can see the gesso poking through and uh, you've got my marks. Now where I've drawn them in pencil, I haven't stuck to them rigidly when I've gone back over in pen. Why haven't I done that? I haven't done that because I don't want it to look like paint by numbers. I don't want her to look like a cardboard cutout stuffed on the surface. So I have purposefully kind of hit and miss my way around and she looks more fluffy too. And why wouldn't you want that in our sheep portrait? So there's the pen work, all done. Now, what we're gonna do, this is a step, this next step, you might want to miss out. And I absolutely understand if you do want to miss it out. 
It is uh, my job today to show you all the different products that this paper will take on board. And so if you've watched any of my demonstrations in the past, you will know that I am a big fan of this product, which is Brusho. So this is a powdered ink, but if Brusho scares you, I get it. If Brusho scares you, you might wanna skip this part out or maybe practice it on a separate piece of paper first. Now I've got dark brown. If I show you the original uh, painting again, you'll be able to see all of that bit around her where you've got those lovely sprinklings of green and brown. That was all done in Brusho. Now we're kind of going to do the abridged version of it today um, because I'm mindful that uh, you want to see me cracking on with it. You don't want to see me poking it around for the rest of the morning. So we're going to use a little bit of dark brown and I've got two greens here. We've got olive green and we've got moss green. I'm going to go for olive green today. The reason that I've brought them both out is to say to you that actually they both split into really interesting colours. So it's worth having a think about which brush powder you're going to go for. Like I said, you know me, I like to experiment, try it out on a piece of paper first. The first thing I'm going to do to make sure that I don't end up with a green sheep or, a, you know, not too much green on my sheep. I'm going to make a little bit of a paper mask for her. So I'm going to make my I'm going to tear up these uh, bits of kitchen roll. And I'm going to lay them down over the top of her. OK, she might get a bit of green on her ears, but that's not the end of the world. Let's just uh, make our way around here. If you're um, working in. Uh, an environment where you have a draft or you're working in an environment where lots of other people are going to waft past you might want to either pin these bits of tissue paper down or um, weight them down with something um, one thing also to mention if you tear kitchen roll from perforated edge to perforated edge you get a straight line if you tear kitchen roll from cut edge to cut edge you get a much more broken edge. Why is that important? It's important because we want our sheep to stay fluffy. So let's continue to just give a bit of a mask out. Now I don't really want to mask out her legs too much because I don't, again, I don't want it to look like a cardboard cutout. So let's just do some sort of thinner strips and we'll kind of vaguely put them in the area. Mm, that's not going to work, is it? I mean, you can do this for hours, if I'm honest. <laughs> you can sit here uh, sending yourself a little bit doolally with bits of kitchen roll. <laughs> Who thought that this would be a job? There we go. Let's lay those down and uh, let's fill that last little hole in. There we go. Not going to do much else to that, but you can see that she's kind of safe when I come to a sprinkling on the brusho. Let's give our pots of brusho a shake. There's the dark brown. There's the olive green. And the other thing I'm gonna do is when I open the pots, I'm gonna open them over to this side on a piece of kitchen roll, just in case. If you've used brush oil, you'll know the just in case. So let's give them a tap. Let's take the lids off. There's the dark brown. Okay, it doesn't look very dark at the moment, but I promise you it is. And here's the olive green. Now look at that. That does not look olive green. Yes, Lynn is saying don't sneeze. <laughs> Yeah, I really don't want to do that right now, Lynn. Um, there is olive green. Doesn't look olive green, does it? Because there's a yellow pigment in there as well as a blue pigment and a brown pigment to make it into the olive green. And the yellow is sitting on the top and looking dominant. But when we sprinkle it on, I promise you, it will be olive green. My method of delivery today, again, we're not going to get into this conversation. Um, you could punch a hole in the top of your pots. You could use a dry brush. I'm going to use a coffee stirrer, a good old fashioned bamboo coffee stirrer. Don't do this over the top of your painting like I'm about to do. <laughs> Don't be stirring it over the top because that way madness lies. Um, give that coffee stirrer a little bit of a tap. This is the dark brown. And so all I'm going to do is I'm going to tap the top of my coffee stirrer and I'm hoping you can see just a little bit. If you've not used Brusho before, I bet you're out there thinking, well, Ali, you know, you said that it was kind of powerful. That doesn't look very powerful, but I cannot impress upon you enough 
how less is more so that'll do for the dark brown I think I think I think I think let's put the lid on because I really don't want to spill it and uh, I've already look, I've already got it I'm covered in it already typical not going to clean off my uh, coffee stirrer because I'm a bit of a rebel that way let's get it into the olive green and uh, let's just tap off the excess change my grip on that coffee stirrer and then over here we'll tap a little bit of that color in too now i'm not really after describing anything this isn't meant to look exactly like a hedge or grass or anything else this is simply to give her a background why am i doing it before i've done everything else i'm doing it before i've done everything else just in case if it goes spectacularly wrong or it needs editing, I can edit over the top of it, rather than doing a painting that I'm really pleased with, waiting till the end, putting the brush show on, and then it all go a bit wrong. So let's put those lids on those, very nervous about those. Yeah, look, see, already spilt it. So if you do it on a bit of kitchen roll, let's move those out of the way. And if you do it on a bit of kitchen roll, look, you can fold that up. I haven't made a mess anywhere, and I can chuck that in the bin under my desk. Right. I'm going to activate the brush out by using a spray bottle. Um, this is one of the SAA's spray bottles. It delivers a nice fine mist. And you want that because you kind of want the water to rain down on the surface. If I hold my spray bottle down here, not only will I blast the powder away from the agave paper, I'll also blast my mask as well. So what I want to do is do it from high up. You can see how close my hand is to the camera rather than being all the way down here so let's give it a bit of a spritz and see what happens so there goes the olive green there goes the brown isn't that exciting oh let's hold that one down with my finger even from this height look it's blasting that uh, kitchen roll and you've got some really interesting color look at that and it's running and doing very exciting things that makes me very happy indeed let's quickly remove that mask so it doesn't start to stain her body and we can go back in with a wet brush to move it around now i'm using saa's imitation sable brushes today you know that they are some of my favorite brushes to use because they will cope with all sorts of mixed media and uh, it means that I don't have to worry about them too much too. Again, as we are on a bit of a theme for environmentally con um, conscious products, of course the SAA imitation sable brushes fall into that category too. So we've got a bit of texture going on. You can see that olivey green coming out. You can use your kitchen roll to lift out some color. You can see that it's lifting very beautifully off of that surface. Um, but I've got that kind of just a hint of colour. That's exactly what I wanted. So let's bring that colour in a little bit closer. Yeah, Rosie is saying it's always exciting to see brusho spreading. You are not wrong, Rosie. It's kind of my one of my most favourite things to do. And I'm going to kind of peter that colour off. You can see the agave paper is handling the brusho really well. In actual fact, here's a little handy hint for some of you. If you have struggled with your brusho, that it comes out a little bit too dark, I grant you that it is all down to the sprinkling. But one thing the agave paper will actually do for you is soften your colour. So you might see that it's kind of a, a little bit more ethereal. That's another reason why I really like this surface. Now, you could leave that to dry and if you're sensible, you'll dry it with your heat gun. I'm going to move on to the next part of the process straight away by introducing some watercolour. Now, uh, I'm using three colours today. You, The success of your painting does not stand or fall on you replicating these colours. Interpret your sheep in a different way, however it makes you happy. I've got three colours here. I've got cerulean blue, that's a bit of a standard, isn't it? I've got cobalt violet deep and I've got Jane's Grey, okay? Um, Jane, Jane's just asked uh, a very uh, kind of pertinent question. What is the surface called rough knot, etc.? Jane, it's a knot surface, so it's not rough and it's not smooth. It's that Goldilocks principle. It falls in the middle, um, more technically known as cold pressed, okay? 
Now these are Daniel Smith watercolors. Again, it doesn't matter what brand of color that you use for this. I'm just using Daniel Smith because the combination of Daniel Smith and this paper is rather beautiful. So I'm gonna start with the Cerulean and the Cobalt Violet Deep. Now this is tubed color, just in case you've not seen me demonstrate before. This is tubed color squeezed out into an empty pan because for me, this is a, a really great consistency. And I'm gonna spray a little bit more water up around the top of the sheet. Look how far the brush -o spreads. I didn't sprinkle it up there, did I? But it sort of migrates its way around. Look, I really didn't sprinkle it up there. So you do, when you're using brush -o, you do sort of have to live with the fact that it's gonna end up in places that you don't expect it to end up. And what I'm gonna do is on top of the brush -o, I'm gonna give her a bit of a kind of backwash of Sky and the Cobalt Violet too. Now look straight away, I'll take you into the close-up camera in just a second when I finish this. So you can see, those of you who are, understand your watercolors a bit more, you will know that there is the prospect of uh, granulation going on. That is where the pigment has physical properties that make it sit in the surface of the paper. So uh, the agave paper takes those granulating pigments and really shows them off. I'll show it to you in close-up camera in just a second. Now, it wouldn't be me without using some violet, would it? I couldn't get away with using Moonglow today, so uh, Cobalt Violet Deep it is. It's sort of my next favourite. Um, so, a couple of people asking if um, it's... If they haven't got brush what else can they use? Uh, yes, watercolour pencil shavings, ink tents uh, shavings, anything that you can sprinkle onto the surface will be absolutely fine. And Martina is astutely pointing out it's the unknown that makes it interesting. I mean, Martina, you, you know I agree with you. I also know that it's the unknown that makes everybody else hyperventilate. <laughs> right, bit of kitchen roll, screwed up into a ball. Take all of the texture out of your kitchen roll. You don't want it to transpose onto here. The minute that your kitchen roll hits the surface is the minute that you can't stick your brush back into it. So if you've got anything else to do to this sheet, do it now before the kitchen roll goes back in. Now you might notice, I know, no moon glow, shocking, shocking. <laughs> I've pulled a little bit of the colour into the sheep herself just because you want there to be a relation between this colour and what's going on in the background but I've faffed about with it enough I now want to do a little bit of rag rolling so this is where I take my kitchen roll and I mop up any excess water and that means that I am in control of it not the other way around and what you also get are some really interesting patterns and textures going on. What I have um, seen is how the cobalt violet and the brush show is mixing down here. Isn't that lovely? Okay, right. Let's just, before I dry it, let's take you over to that uh, close-up camera so that you can see the granulation in more detail. Look how those colors are reacting really well with that agave surface. Isn't that beautiful? It's got a shine on it at the moment because it is very, very wet indeed. But let's take you down to where I was talking about how the watercolor and the brush is mixing together. Isn't that delicious? And that's what I'm always looking for in papers, are things that are going to help me out with the texture or with the personality of whatever it is that I am using without me having to interfere with it too much. And this agave paper certainly fits the bill. Now what I do need, oh, I've got stuff everywhere. I'm such a messy painter. Um, what I do need to do is to give that a really good dry. So can you just bear with me whilst I do that? Let's give it a really good dry. So one of the joyful things about this being in a block format is that it will dry back flat again. But if you're using the agave paper in sheet form, then dry it on the back and dry it on the front as well. And then it will go back 
to how it was previously. Now you will take a lot more time and effort over your drawing and the laying down of your colour. Your paintings will be much more successful than mine because you won't be rushing against time constraints. So just a little bit more heat. Don't forget, if you have any questions at all, get them into that live chat so that I can go back through afterwards and answer anything that I may have missed. So we're nearly there. Now I haven't dried it nearly as much as I could have or should have, but look how flat it is. Look at it. Isn't that awesome? Yeah. So it's it's drying really beautifully flat. Really beautifully flat. Anne has just said that uh, she loves how I have so much faith in you. Of course I do, Anne. Your paintings will be an absolute triumph. I just know it. Why would they not be? <laughs> so we've got background of sheep done now we can concentrate on uh, foreground of sheep and now we've got the exciting prospect of dropping in the colour over the top of the gesso uh, doing um, letting it kind of run letting it do its own thing and uh, we'll get lots of textures that's what we're, we're heading for Jan is asking can you use masking fluid on agave or will it lift the paper Jan I have done some experiments with masking fluid um, standard masking fluid rules apply your masking fluid needs to be fresh so nothing more than between 6 to 12 months old I will say um, the blue SAA masking fluid works really really well use a mask away to take it off because that will uh, erase it nice and cleanly and uh, make sure that you don't leave it on the paper for too long give it a nice thin layer do whatever it is you have to do and lift it off and it will be fine it's the adhesive on masking tape it doesn't seem to like whereas masking fluid you're just kind of giving it a coat across the surface rather than actually putting something sticky down onto it um, but I have tested out the masking fluid and it worked absolutely well for me um, Angela is uh, please don't um, apologize for being uh, late. Um, Angela's asking what texture did I use? I used gesso, Angela. If you uh, want to, when the broadcast is over, if you want to wind it back to the beginning, you'd be very welcome to see uh, me describe the gesso that I used and how I used it. Um, lots of bit. Uh, Joy is asking a very interesting question. Would you get a better result if you let it dry naturally regarding granulation as opposed to drying with a heat gun? Joy, that's a brilliant question and the answer is yes. You're always going to get a better finish on your surface if you allow things to dry naturally. But, you know, as much as we love each other's company of a Tuesday morning, I really don't think you want to be sitting here watching me have a cup of coffee watching this dry. So, yes, let yours dry naturally and you'll get a much nicer finish. Morning, everybody who has just joined us. Right. I'm going to do some work back into the sheep. I'm going to do something called blocking in. So I'm going to throw lots and lots of colour at her and I'm going to allow it to do its thing. And then I'm going to see what we've got before... I go back in and finish her off with various kinds of pen. I'm still sticking with my SAA imitation sable brush. It's still the size 10 that I used for the background. I'm not going to deviate from that too much. What I am going to do is have a couple of things in my hand. So I've got my bit of kitchen roll to be able to control the amount of water that I'm using. I've got my cerulean blue that I had before and I've got my Jane's grey. This is a colour that is particular to Daniel Smith watercolours. It is a convenience colour. It is uh, burnt sienna and ultramarine uh, pigments mixed together. So it is a slightly lazy colour on my part. I just struggle to make as good a colour as Daniel Smith done when they combine the two together. So that's why I use it. If you don't have Jane's Grey, you could, of your course, use the SAA's 
translucent grey, which many of you know is uh, one of the colours that I demonstrate with rather a lot. Elaine is saying, I've got to get ready to go to work. Is there a catch up I can watch later? I'm really enjoying this as I have five pet sheep. Oh, Elaine, I'm jealous. Yes, Elaine, if you go back to the SAA's Facebook page, so the page that you're currently on, Go to the videos tab and you'll see it archived on there. Or as Rosie is very kindly pointing out, I will put it on the blog on my um, website. So I'll give you all the details of that towards the end. Right, let's get painting the sheep. So I need to uh, brighten up her face a little bit. So I know this looks weird because it's blue, but sometimes if you use a little bit of cerulean blue, it can make your whites look whiter. So I use cerulean as a bit of a mechanism quite a lot. Now, like I said, you could make your sheep pink, you could make it green, you can do whatever you like with it. You do not have to stick with these colours. Now, I'm very excited to get it interacting with that gesso and it's working really well. I'm so pleased with that. Um, let's get some of the Jane's Grey in too. Particularly want to concentrate the Jane's Grey around her face so that her face comes forward. But I, like I said, I am just blocking in at the moment. I'm not making too many deductions about what I need and when I need it. My tones won't be particularly well balanced. Um, I was talking to somebody this week who uh, described this part of painting as the ugly section that point where you're kind of, you've come so far and yet your painting doesn't look quite right yet. And I understand that completely. Um, it's, you, you know, you've done loads of work, you feel like you've sort of slogged away at it and yet it doesn't really come together as you would like. So we're making our way through the ugly phase right now. I'm dotting that colour in. I'm sorry, but she's going to have to have some violet on her. <laughs> has to be done let's stick a little bit in because why wouldn't you want a violet sheep that's better now again my tones are out of whack so I've got the same tonal value on the sheep as I have in the background but we can take care of that with a little bit of negative painting in a moment all I'm trying to do is to get some color on her and to get my color interacting with that gesso so I'm going to make it a little bit darker here in the middle so that it starts to split and separate. Let's lift off a few elements. And then what I'll do is I will take you to the overhead camera. Let's just get that in so that you can see with the gesso how that colour is interacting. Look at that. Isn't that exciting? I mean, what's not to like about that, everybody? So you've got the agave paper working really beautifully. You've got the gesso splitting the colour. Here you've got a bit of granulation going on. So all of those lovely textural elements are working well for me. Now, like I said, there is an imbalance in my tones, which if I don't address it soon, I'm going to be in trouble. I don't really want to do a lot more to the sheep. Because, you know, she's a sheep, she's white, I kind of want to bring the darks out. But I do need to start addressing what's going on in the background. And for this, we're going to use our brusho in its alternative format. Thank you, Anne. Anne is saying that she loves the effect of the fleece. So whilst I've got some nice texture going on all over the place, it's too much, it's too even at the moment. She's sort of disappearing into the background. So what we're going to do is we're going to use the brush out to make it up as an ink. So I'm going to take a little bit of it again. You don't need an awful lot of this. Where shall I deposit this? Oh, let's put it in the middle. So popping that in there, lid back on. Oh, and then I'm going to add some water to it. Now watch this change. This is too much fun. If I stick some water into that, look how it goes from that orangey yellow into that olive green. Isn't that lovely? We've used it to its best advantage, all split around her. Now we want it for its depth of colour. Now, ideally, if you get to this part of it, you uh, might want to dry this. I haven't got time this morning. I want to crack on with it, so I'm going to use it as it is. Now, for those of you who are a little bit more um, 
have a little bit more experience with your watercolour, you may know of a technique called blending out. Blending out is where we lay a bit of colour down and we add some water to it and we pull it away from our subject matter so that we get that nice diffused vignette kind of look. That doesn't work with brusho, okay, because the ink is based more like a dye than it is like a pigment. So the minute that colour hits the paper, it's going to sink into the surface and you won't be able to pull it away, which is very disappointing. So you have to reverse what it is that you want to do with it. OK, you ready for this? So what happens is you put the water down first. You put the water where you want the brusho to run into. Then the brusho can go in and then it starts to diffuse. So if we take that green we lay it down quickly and then we smudge straight away then we can still get that lovely diffused look still got the texture coming through where we sprinkled it but now look at that straight away because this is a deeper tone this starts to pop out at you so let's repeat that process down here in the feet so there goes the water you don't need much of this color at all there it is, it can go in, can be spread out into that water. Let's take a little bit up into her feet as well. We can do some kind of grassy nonsense down in there. A little bit of kitchen roll goes into, all of a sudden she starts to make more sense. Oh no, what am I sticking my brush back in that for, Ali? Not paying attention. Uh, water down, so I'm gonna repeat that process. Not all the way around her because we, again, we don't wanna give her a sort of halo all we're trying to do is to balance up those tones again. Um, I need a little bit more of that. I want it to be darker in here. I can always go back over with a bit of extra uh, Jane's Grey watercolour if I want to. That's all right. You can layer it up. You can glaze it in. That's not a problem. Let's uh, do a bit of mark making for grasses. My board is on a slight slope as well, which is why um, it's kind of going south a little bit more. If it worries you then uh, don't um, tip your board up, have it flat. So that water's going in, blending it out, a few uh, grassy, I do call it grassy nonsense, don't I? <laughs> uh, let's get that in. So again, can you see how she's starting to stand out a little bit more now? Just got to keep an eye on some of it. Some of it you can always go back in and, and deepen a little bit more if you want to. Let's do that over here, quite like that. I'm going to need some more brusho. Who knew that was a thing? Should we be really brave or really daft, one or the other? Let's tap it out. Uh, I've got that kind of devil may care attitude today. <laughs> I think it's because I'm having too much fun. I think that's the reason. There we go. Oh, that is dark, isn't it? That's lovely. Look at that. Oh, that's rather delicious. So what this does prove as well is how the agave paper will stand up to you uh, building it up in layers if you prefer to work that way. It's holding up to uh, the job really very well indeed. Let's do a few more of those. Let's, um, uh, 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 where do we want some green? I want to deepen the sky around it. So I think maybe just a little bit more green on this side, going back in with that colour, going into the kind of the nooks and crannies of her fleece. I can work on that a little bit more later on. A little bit of water to blend it out taking care of it with a little bit of rag rolling. And then up at the top, I need to uh, just deepen some of the colours around her head so that her fleece stands out. So we'll take that cobalt violet and we'll strengthen it around her ears and around the top of her head. Again, don't want to do it all over, just want to do it enough so that she looks kind of interesting. There we go, that's a bit better. Hopefully you can see how this is building up. There's no detail on it yet. That's going to come in just a second. What it does need is a spectacular dry in a moment. But we've got a last little bit of depth of colour to go in there. And that's better. She is standing out a little bit more now. Excellent. Right. Let's give her a bit of a dry before we go in and put the detail on. Let's give it a waft. Bear with me while I do this.
so what I'm doing whilst I'm drying this is I'm getting, uh, I'm having a really good look at stuff. And I'm asking myself, what do I need to alter? What needs to change? Where do I need to put my shadows? Do I have enough highlights or do I need to add them back in? These are all questions that need to be addressed in that final pass of detail. Now she's got little bits of green on her, but I don't dislike that. I wouldn't try to take those out. That kind of gives evidence of the background color. There's a few hard lines here and there, but my question will always be, does it stop it looking like a sheep? Of course it doesn't. I'm thrilled with the way that the watercolor and the agave paper and the brusho have all worked together. I think all I really need to do now is to work on some shadows and to work on some extreme highlights. But the paper's standing up to it really well. And if you think about it, I have not been kind to it at all. There we go. So it's nice and flat still, absolutely flat as a stamp and uh, those colours in. Let's, while that's uh, just cooling off, let's take you into that uh, close-up view so that you can see all the colours kind of melding together, skipping over the top of the gesso. There's that little green uh, extra bit. Down here at the bottom, you can see where I've drawn back in with the handle of my brush. There's the grassy nonsense. Here's that lovely deep colour of brusho. Beverly, if you um, want to head back to the beginning of the broadcast, um, I talk uh, lots about the agave paper. This is a paper that I am showcasing today by Hannah Mule. Um, let's uh, take you into the top view again. This is the paper that I am using today. Um, you can see um, all the details of that right at the start of the broadcast or you can read more about it on the blog. Angela, no, it's not the inkjet paper. It's uh, specifically, let's just uh, show you that again, it is the watercolour. It's not their digital range. It's not the agave digital range that Hannah Mule have. Um, whilst that is excellent as well for printing on to, this is their, what's called their natural line. It's the watercolour paper version of it. And the lovely Nula is saying that she likes the close-up. Thank you very much. And thank you for being there, Nula, this morning. Morning. It's um, it's lovely to have you here in Technique Tuesday answering those questions that I might not be able to get to. So here we have a sheep and uh, said sheep needs a little bit of detail to finish her off. Now this is standard for me isn't it? If you've watched uh, one of the uh, previous Technique Tuesday broadcasts you will know of my love of the Posca pen. So just in case you don't know, if you're new to Technique Tuesday, joining us for the first time, in which case, you know, um, the Posca pens are a paint marker. They are water soluble when they are wet and they are waterproof when they are dry, which means that I can draw with them. I can smudge them with a damp brush and I can make them look like paint. So I'm just trying to decide what brush I want to use as me, uh, which we never, uh, number four. So I'm switching to the SAA's Imitation Sable number four brush. Let's just give you a bit of an illustration of how these pens work. So they are a paint marker. So when you first get them, you do need to give them a bit of a shake. You possibly need to pump them up and down on uh, paper to get them to work. But what you can do with them is draw with them um, and then take a damp brush to them and you can smudge them out. So a little bit like a watercolour pencil or an ink tense pencil. The difference being that uh, these dry absolutely waterproof. So they're a bit like an acrylic paint. And also you can use these over the top of pretty much anything. So you can use them over the top of watercolour. You can use them over the top of acrylic. They go brilliantly over the top of acrylic paintings. 
And if your oil painting has been dry for a considerable amount of time, they will go over the top of your oil paintings too. I'm going to use them for bringing out some of the detail in the sheep. And for that, we're going to rely on um, the overhead camera, the close up camera, so that you can see exactly what I'm doing to her face. Now, let's just have a think about what we want to do and where we want to put it. Let's have a look at, let's have a quick look at her again. So she needs some deep shadows around her face. She needs a bit of colour in the ear. Um, maybe a little bit of yellow in her eye as well. We'll do a small amount of tweaking. I probably won't be able to tweak it as much as I would like, but um, you'll be able to spend lots more time on your paintings than I necessarily have had time to do myself. So let's drop a little bit of that yellow in for the eye on that side and uh, on that side too. Stick that pen to one side. Um, oh, should we be, oh, I never know, should we do black or should, no, let's do gray. Let's do gray. This is, um, so these are all the, what's called a PC1M. This is 0 0.7 in size. Um, and it has, you can see a nice fine tip. So I can make my way around the face. This is the dark gray and I can use the tip of my brush to blend that colour out and look how her face is starting to pop off the page. So we'll go around uh, that side too, just doing a little bit of blending out. There we go, starting to look more three-dimensional already. I've got one last little trick that I want to do with a different pen uh, to finish her off, but for the time being, I want some subtlety. So we'll pop a little bit of that in there. We'll see how much we can cram. We've got uh, 10 minutes, nine minutes to go. We'll see how much I can cram in to the last uh, nine minutes of painting. Uh, so it's these, is the kind of the devil's in the detail, isn't it? We've done all of the impressionistic parts. We've let the paper do the thing it does best. Now it's over to us to finish off that little bit of stuff that's gonna pull her forward. And like I said, you may decide to do a lot more than I'm doing, but that is entirely your choice. Just be mindful of the faffing, of course. I had to talk about faffing, didn't I? I couldn't not talk about faffing. Just make sure that you're not doing things for the sake of doing them, that you are actually painting because it needs something else to happen. Uh, what else have we got? Uh, let's move her up a little bit. We can put a bit of extra detail in the fleece if we want to. We can add a few marks, dots and dashes. You know me and my love of Morse code painting and drawing to suggest texture. There's a big old blob of water there that needs to go. And I'm working quickly. I do. You probably notice I do a little bit at a time. I don't try to do lots of it and then smudge it because I would always be afraid that it would dry and I wouldn't get the opportunity to work back into it. So those last few bits and then we're going to do the extreme darks and the extreme lights in those uh, dying moments before we say our goodbyes. So uh, there she is with a few uh, shadows on her. Let's take you back to uh, the overhead camera so you can see how she's coming together but she does need some real dark. So you remember those Unipin pens that I had before in the dark gray. I'm uh, going to go back in with the black. So let's go back to overhead. And now I can really go to town with this. I can draw back in and you'll see the difference. Things will start to kind of pop off the page with that extra little bit of depth coming in. Not doing it all over, just doing it where it matters. Kind of pupil of her eye. They have a letterbox shaped pupils, just in case you've never seen a sheep up close and personal. Very interesting eyes. Same with goats. Those of you I know who enjoyed my uh, talking about my Steve goat painting during Dorset Art Weeks, same principle there. So you can go back in, we can add that little bit little bit of effort over the back to bring those parts forwards. Let's take you back into uh, that overhead camera. So hopefully she's looking a bit sharper. 
She is lacking a few highlights, it has to be said. I've gone a bit bonkers with them, with the colour, but that's what white gouache is for. White gouache, if you're a mixed media painter, you don't have to worry so much about leaving the white behind. Now, look at this surface. It's had gesso, watercolour, pen, brusho, posca, and now it's going to have gouache on it. I don't know many papers that would stand up to that amount of battering. So back into this colour, back into our gouache, making it into a nice kind of single double cream consistency. And I'm going to use my brush. Actually, it needs to be a bit thicker than that. <laughs> I said that to you and then I haven't made it the right consistency myself. Using the tip of my brush to bring out a few highlights and I'm not going to give you any marks for how I'm going to finish this painting off. I bet you can guess what's the technique I'm going to be using to finish off my sheep. Oh, Martina's asking, has the sheep got a name? Answers on a postcard, please. If somebody wants to name the sheep, get your name suggestions in now. And I will choose the one that I think is uh, the most apt. So we know that there's some spattering coming up, don't we? We just know it. I'm going to make this section of her body. Yes, Julie, you're absolutely right. It wouldn't be a painting of mine without some spatter going on at the end, would it? Oh, look at that. What's that lurking in my paint? I've added a bit of gouache um, back into this back section of her coat to brighten it a little bit. I could have probably done more with her feet. <laughs> There's a spattering alert going on. Um, I could have done a bit more work down here in the grass, but today is about experimenting. It's not necessarily about the amount of detail that we put in. It's so that you can see uh, all of these techniques at work and you can see how fabulously the paper holds together. <gasps> yes, Sean the sheep. I'd call it Sean, Heather, if it wasn't for the fact that it is actually a you. <laughs> Seanette, maybe. Keep your suggestions coming in. Right, I've got this dark shadow going on down here, just because I realised I'd missed it out. And uh, Shabitha. Oh, I'm liking that, Jill. Hannah. Rabina, that's brilliant. I like Hannah. I was very, very close to painting a donkey, but I <laughs> didn't want to push my luck. Agave, yes, all very, very good suggestions. Right, going to take my Jane's Grey, and that is how I'm going to end up with the Spazza Shauna. Love it. Uh, oh my goodness, I've got people making name suggestions all over. I love the interaction that you guys give me for Technique Tuesday. What's not to like, Doris? Brilliant. Yuina. <laughs> so we've got that bit of uh, Jane's Grey being spattered over the top. And then down at the bottom, I'm going to take some of this uh, brush -o. Daisy, brilliant. Down here, um, in amongst her feet so that it can give her something to stand on. Um, we could spray that with a little bit of the spray bottle going in there so that I can draw back into it, add some a few kind of extra grasses at the front, hide up those hooves. And uh, do you know what? I'm gonna leave it there, but don't forget, of course, we need to have a really good look at her in that close-up camera, don't we? So that you can see the paper doing the thing that it does best. Look at the amount of texture in that. And yes, I could probably have done more work on her face, but um, I choose not to today. There's that spatter. We've got that bit of brush -o and those marks down by her hooves. That little bit of gouache there just to brighten the back of her fleece. And you may notice that um, I've got gouache around the sides of her too to bring her forward. So let's give you the one last uh, bit of an overhead shot before we say our goodbyes. So let's get you where I can see you. Oh, I've gone all squiffy eyed. I've been concentrating so, so hard. Right, some information for you for where you can find uh, your resources, now, if you want to watch this broadcast again, there are two places that you can go and see it. You can either go back onto the SAA's Facebook page. If you're watching live, that's where you are now. Go back onto the videos tab and you'll be able to see that there. 
Um, at 10 o'clock, a blog post went live on my own website. Let's share that address with you. So that's www.alisonseaboard-fineart.co.uk forward slash Ali's hyphen blog. Just go to my website and navigate down. The um, broadcast, of course, isn't there yet because we're still in the midst of it. But the resources are there. The links are there to where you can purchase the paper. If you would like to uh, buy a sample of the paper, the amazing team over at Hannah Mule are offering you the opportunity to purchase a sample. The link is there. It's in this broadcast as well. The sample is only going to cost you £1.50 as long as you put in capital letters sample shipping or one word at the checkout they will send it to you free of charge so you don't have to invest a whole lot of money if you're not sure and if you'd rather test it out beforehand i think that's an amazing amazing offer um, it means that you can give it a go you could try the sheep on it if you wanted to but the link is there as well if you would like to purchase a pad and have a go with it from the saa now i know a lot of you out there have been saying you know um, this is a new paper for you ali why do you uh, particularly enjoy it i enjoy it because i have struggled for a long long time i know that some of you out there don't necessarily want to invest huge amounts of money in a 100% cotton paper. I know that there are some of you out there who want to shop more environmentally consciously so that you know that your money, your hard earned money is going towards something that is sustainable. And this is the first time you know that I've struggled for a long time to find a paper that is more reasonably priced and that has the environment in mind. And that is why I recommend this agave paper. You know me as well. I would not put my name to it unless I thought it would work for you. And I hope that today's demonstration is real evidence of that that. Now I have some thank yous uh, to make. I want to uh, thank all of you guys out there for taking the time to tune in. Um, this has been Technic Tuesday Takeover. So um, this is the last one that I'm doing on the SAA page. Next week, Technic Tuesday is back on my Facebook page, on the Alison Seaboard Facebook page. We have another special broadcast for you. If you want to learn more about that broadcast, you're going to have to go over to the blog to read more about it, but it will be at 10 o'clock as well. Now, I just want to go through a few final comments. We are running a little bit over time, but never mind. Um, lots of people saying uh, thank you. Uh, you're all very, very welcome indeed. It's lovely to have you here. Um, lots of... Um, people saying that it was interesting to see the paper which is grand it's always my pleasure to share materials with you so that you can see whether they fit for you um, lots of people still putting in um, name suggestions for that keep those coming um, the team at Hannah Mule are saying thank you Ali and the SAA brilliant workshop you are very welcome thank you so much for the invitation it means a lot you um, you have no idea what it's like uh, to be supported by guys like you and yes thank you to Hannah Mule Thank you to the SAA team. Thank you to all you guys uh, for tuning in as well. It's been a privilege to share this morning with you. I do hope you enjoyed the demonstration. Take lots and lots of care of yourselves, won't you? And I will see you very soon. Bye, everyone.